So this is the first of many um, days we'll spend on practicing identities. Um, the opening day, we'll talk about strategies, we'll talk about um, things to look for, and about form, because form is always important when we're doing identities. We want to get that set first. So normally when we're doing this in class, um, I do this as an opening reminder of what form is like, because you should have uh, establish the proper form in grade 11. Um, so that's what we're going to do quickly, but it's not a very interesting identity, but it's a good proof if you've never seen it. Um, and it is a, a proof of one of the identities that we're going to use. So it's good to do that. So um, here's the relationship between sine, cosine, and tangent. And remember that just based on Sokotoa, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tan is opposite over adjacent. So that's what we're going to do. And then the conjecture is that tan is equal to sine over cos. This is one of the identities that we use to prove further identities in grade 11. And here's the reminder of how we actually establish that this identity is true. So, and we're going to focus, as I said, we're going to focus on form while we're doing this. So our form is that we separate the left side and the right side just like that, okay? And this is a must. We do not solve these like equations where we manage both sides at the same time. We work on them separately, okay? And then, again, the trick to identities is there's no clear path, there's no step-by-step -step system to prove these, to answer these questions, or to create these solutions. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so we're going to get to some strategies, things to look for in a moment, uh, but um, I'm going to go through this proof first. Again, usually in a regular year, uh, we do this demonstration together, and then we actually break out into small groups and just practice solving uh, a bunch of identities independently since we don't since we can't do that this year um, I'm just gonna go through a, a bunch of proofs uh, and we're gonna look at the uh, as I say um, the structure of how you set up a proof the expectations of how you show your work and again a reminder of um, the strategies Okay, so I'm going to start on this side tan, and I'm going to change it to opposite over adjacent. Okay, and then for sine, same thing. I'm going to rewrite it as opposite over hypotenuse, and then cosine. So all of that, that sine on top, over adjacent over hypotenuse. Okay, and then I'm going to use our understanding of how to divide fractions. This is one fraction divided by another fraction. So how do you do that? You flip and multiply. So I'm flipping the bottom fraction. And then we can see that the hypotenuses will divide to one. And I get opposite over adjacent. So just using Sokotoa, we're able to prove that this identity is true, that tan is indeed equal to sine theta over cos theta. Now the proof for cotan is, um, is similar. You could use the reciprocal ratios for cos and sine and do the same thing. It would look almost identical to this one. So I'll leave that to you. Um, but, you know, we can also take it by definition that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. Um, and, and that's one of the facts that we're going to use. Okay, So you can try that one if you want, but this is the structure of how identities should be presented, where we have the left side separately from the right side, um, and we work on each side independently. And at the very end, <clears throat> when I'm finished, I say... This equals the left side in this case. I did most of the work on the right side, so I'm going to show it that way. And then I say QED, and we're going to come back to this in a minute, but you don't have to say QED, but you have to say some kind of summary statement that therefore you are done. Therefore, the original identity that you were set out to be trying to prove 
that you have proven. Okay. There's, a con there's another common uh, way that we end proofs in mathematics you may or may not have seen, which is with just a little square like that. Um, and that seems to be an accepted way of ending proofs in mathematics. So you could do that, or you could do QBD, or you could just say left side equals right side, therefore, and state, restate the identity that, that, it, that it's true. Okay. Now, these are the only identities for now that we are allowed to actually use in our proofs. So we're allowed to use the reciprocal identities for sine and cosine. And for each of these, you know, if cosecant is equal to 1 over sine, then also sine is equal to 1 over cosecant. So we can use definitely both versions of that, both versions of the cosine and its reciprocal. We can use tan being equal to sine over cos, and then for cotan, the reciprocal, or you could go straight to sine and cosine, and again, it's the reciprocal of tangent, so cosine over sine. So you can use any of those reciprocal ratios or the relationship between tangent and sine and cos. And we only have one other one that we're allowed to use, and this is called the Pythagorean identity, okay? And it's sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Uh, and as a reminder, sine squared theta and cosine squared theta, what that means is sine theta all squared, right? That's what it actually means. This is the short form way of writing it. Now, the other thing that we're going to be allowed to use is the rearranged version of these. So you don't always have to use this form and then do the rearranging. For example, if I take cos squared theta and move it to the other side, I get sine squared theta equals 1 minus cos squared theta. Or similarly for cos, I can use that. So any, th any of those three forms you're allowed to use, you could replace sine squared theta with 1 minus cos squared th theta and so on. That's fine, um, but we're not allowed to make any other jumps, so you can't use any other identities, not yet at least. There will be a couple more that we add this year, um, but these are the ones that we're allowed to use, so we're allowed to replace. And then there are other things that we are allowed to do, um, like factoring or expanding, right? There are other skills we're allowed to do, but these are the only identities that we're allowed to use. So strategies. These are good things to write down, and if you're stuck to go over them and remind yourself of these strategies. They're fairly straightforward, but, but um, it's, it's a matter of when you use them and how you use them that makes identities more challenging or less challenging. Okay, so um, especially as you're starting out, uh, you, you will probably want to have these written down and look at them and sort of go through them one by one and decide which one is best for particular um, for a particular identity that you're trying to solve. Okay, so work on each side independently. We already talked about that. But the trick to this one is, and this is really important. You're often so it says right here. So between these first two, work on each side independently and start with the more complicated side. None of these are hard rules. It's not, it's not that you have to do it. These are suggestions. And often what we actually do is with the less complicated side, we might actually do one or two quick steps and then we're done. And then most of the work happens on the more complicated side. Okay? So, but the point is, as you're working on the more complicated side, you want to absolutely keep an eye on the other side. And this is because the other side will give you clues as to what direction you want to go next. So as you're working, you want to look back at the other side. And this is all about observation. It's all about things that you notice as you're working. And these things that we notice, like I say, they're clues, and they tell us which direction to go next. And sometimes there are very good clues if you, if you can see them, and, and they really will... Um, uh, tell us what, what to do and what direction we should be going, okay? So that's for starters. Uh, whenever you see squares, you're looking, you're pr 
you have the opportunity to use the Pythagorean identity, sine squared theta plus co squared theta is one, only if it's squared, right? It doesn't work if it's not squared. So that's something that you can look for. If you have a sine squared theta, you can replace it. If you have a co squared theta, you can replace it. Something to think about. Generally speaking, this is a really big one. We change everything to sine and cos. So if you have reciprocal ratios, cosecant and secant, or if you have tangent or cotangent, very often we're going to change everything in terms of sine and cosine. Okay. Uh, another big one, common denominators. This only obviously works if you have fractions, but if we're talking reciprocal ratios and we're going to have fractions. So when we have that, um, if there's, in particular, if there's nothing else to do, try getting a common denominator. It's amazing how things work out uh, and, and things start to uh, become clearer when you do that. Okay, multiply by the reciprocal. Um, so this is for dividing fractions. We have to remember how to do that. Uh, sometimes it's very useful to multiply in a convenient way by one. That's sometimes how we get a common denominator. So there's a few of those little tricks that we do when we're, when we're doing uh, identities. And then the last two are sort of related. Factor, sometimes you're looking to factor, but sometimes you're looking to expand and simplify. And this one says, sort of in an unhelpful way, when useful. Well, how are you supposed to know when it's useful? Well, that's part of the art of doing identities, and there's no, there, there's no uh, rule for when it's going to be useful and when it's not. But it's something to think about, that sometimes when we have the ability to expand, what you might just do is, what would it look like if I expanded it, and would that be helpful? Would, is that going to get me closer to the other side of the identity? Okay. So we are going to look to factor when we can. Often, if you can factor, that's probably what you're supposed to do. Um, but otherwise, um, sometimes we might want to expand. So we do have, to, so as I said, there, there is a bit of an art to deciding when to do which one, when to go one direction, when to go the other. And the last thing is, if you've never seen it before, uh, that's an explanation of what QED stands for. It's a Latin term, quad erat demonstrandum, and it, what it actually means is that which was to be demonstrated. So it's a way of summarizing and saying, this is what I was supposed to be showing, and I've done it, so I'm done. So it's a good way to sum up your proof. So we're just going to do a few, and I would encourage you to pause the video and actually try this one. This is what we would do if we were doing it together in class. Um, and in and you know the first few, you might have a hard time getting going, but once we get warmed up, hopefully we start to see it. Uh, and so um, if you're looking at this and you're thinking to yourself, I don't even know where to start, well, there's an easy way to start, and that is, remember, we have to separate the left side from the right side. So sometimes just starting to write even if you don't really know what steps you're doing, just starting to write stuff down gets our brain moving. And now that I've got it set out in the left side and the right side, well, I can see that there's nothing I can do with the right side. I mean, one can be changed into lots of things. It could be 10 over 10. It could be 5 over 5. It could be all sorts of things. But that's probably not going to be very helpful to try to change that. So I'm not going to work on the right side. I'm going to leave that alone. On the left side, I'm looking at this, and if, if, you have, if you're looking at that and have no idea, well, this is what I mean. Go back to that list and look at the strategies. Go down the list and decide which one applies, and you'll see one of them says, change everything to sine and cos, and this is where some students struggle. They don't see how this is going to be helpful. Sometimes you have to do it anyway. You have to have faith in the strategies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this tan and I'm going to change it to sine over cos. And since it's tan squared, it's sine squared over cos squared times cos squared plus cos squared. And then hopefully we notice that I, because I'm, this fraction is multiplied by cos squared, the cos, this is like cos squared over 1, right? So those will divide to 1. And I'm just left with sine squared. And just like that, it's pretty amazing how nicely that works out. And this is the Pythagorean identity. Another one of the strategies is look for those when you have, um, uh, 
when you see sine squares and cos squares, be, keep, that, keep in mind that you're probably going to be using the Pythagorean identity, and that is equal to 1, which equals the right side, and then you're done. Okay, hopefully that one went well. Again, I would suggest pausing the video and trying this one on your own. Um, and, and then if you can get it, great. And then resume the video to make sure that you did it right. You know, showing our steps is imp an important part of this as well. So make sure that you're reflecting on how you're showing your work as you go. Um, but we are gonna have lots of days to keep working away at that. And then you can resume the video, or if you get stuck, resume the video. Uh, to see maybe what my ideas of what the next steps are. And again, I'm going to try to share my thinking and, and why I choose to do what I do. Because if you watch somebody else doing it, it all makes sense. But the, the, the struggle with identities is how did that person know to do that? And it's not always about knowing what to do. It's just about I think this is a good first step and I'll see where it takes me. And sometimes it might take you down the wrong path and you have to go back and try something else. But once you start to get better and better at these, you, you will start to make better guesses at what to do first and it will often take you down the right path. So pause the video, try it yourself, and then join me after um, to see what my solution would look like. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you've had a chance to try this one out. I'm going to get it set up here. Remember, we don't do any work on this first step. I just want it written out. It was a great example of how there's nothing to do on the right side. The right side is one. There's lots of things that you could turn that into. It could be sine squared plus cos squared. It could be sine over sine, cos over cos. I mean, it could be anything. And we have no idea. So we're just going to leave that alone. And we can pretty much say, in this case, all the work is going to be done on the left. And what do I see on the left? I see a fraction. Um, but there's not much I can do with this fraction the way it is. But I see a reciprocal and a tan. So I, I see a lot of things that are not written in sine and cos. And even though there's no sine and cos on the right side, so there's no indication that things need to be in sine and cos, um, there's still not really anything I can do with it in this form. I don't have any identities that are tan squared identities or secant squared identities. So we're going to have to change everything to sine and cos. And that's going to give us more options. So secant squared theta is 1 over cos, 1 plus tan squared theta is sine squared theta over cos squared theta. I'm just going to clean that up a little bit. Okay. And now I've got two things. I've got a fraction in, a f in fractions. And when we have that, we can multiply by the reciprocal. And that's what it looks like when I can do that. There's a fraction inside a fraction. Okay. Um, but I can't actually do that yet in this case because I have this sum on the bottom, so the multiplying is not really going to work. But that's the other thing that we have, is we have a fraction, which is this, uh, plus something, whatever it is. Whether it's a fraction or not doesn't matter. That's the situation where you can get a common denominator. And so that's what I'm going to do because there's nothing else that jumps out at me that I can do. I could start swapping cos squareds and sine squareds with the... Um, Pythagorean identity, but I don't know what I would be swapping them to, so I'm not going to do that yet. So I'm going to change 1 to cos squared over cos squared plus sine squared over cos squared. And you could do this in one step. You don't have to show two steps here. Now I've got cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. Remember, if, if you're trying to do this on your own, pause the video at any time. If this was the step that you were stuck on, now that you've got it, maybe pause it and see if you can do the next step because every little bit that you can do on your own is going to help you in the future. So now you're looking for what to do next. Yes, I could flip and multiply, and that wouldn't be wrong. We could do that at this stage. Something else jumps out at me that's going to simplify this, so that's what I'm going to do first, and that's that I have the Pythagorean identity right there. 
cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is the same as sine squared theta plus cos squared theta. So um, that's 1. So I've got 1 over cos squared theta over 1 over cos squared theta. Now I've got fractions divided by fractions. I will flip and multiply times. So I'm flipping this bottom one from 1 over cos to cos over 1. And now I can see that these divide out, and I'm left with 1 over 1, which is 1, Okay, which was the right side, so we're done. So that's how that one works. Now, from this step, you could actually see that this is something divided by the same something, so it's just 1. So you don't have to show this step of flipping and multiplying in this case. In other cases, you have to because it's not just something over itself, but in this case, you wouldn't have had to show that step, if, as long as you understand how that works. Okay, moving on to the next one again, I would recommend pausing and trying yourself, see if there's anything you can come up with. So I kind of feel like the right side won't have much to do on it. So I'm going to flip both of these. Um, and you could do this all at once again. Cos squared theta, cosecant, sorry, cosecant squared theta is 1 over sine squared theta times secant squared theta, because this was cosecant times secant, so I'm multiplying after I flip, times 1 over cos squared theta. But I don't really want those as separate fractions, I don't think. So really what this is, and again, you could do this all in one shot, is 1 over sine squared theta cos squared theta. Okay? You could do all of that uh, in, in one step. And at that point, I think it's done. That's why I did this first, because I thought, kind of thought, yeah, it's probably not going to go very far. So I just did that. Okay? And I'm going to leave that for now. Maybe I'll come back to it, but I'm suspicious that I won't. On this side, same thing. I've got cosecants and secants. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swap them out, just like we did on the right side. But since these, in this case, we're adding, I uh, can't just jam them, them together. I need a common denominator. So my common denominator will be sine squared theta times cos squared theta. Um, because that's, that's how you do a common denominator. So, um, you know, don't copy this down, but if it's 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, my common denominator is going to be 6, 2 times 3. And to do that, this one is times 3 over 3, and this one is times 2 over 2, because in each case I've multiplied by 1, and I get 3 over 2 times 3, which is 6, plus 2 over 2 times 3 which is six. So you can see that it's a product of the denominators. For some of you, looking, looking at it in numbers might help. For some of you, it might not, um, because you might not have done a lot of fraction math with numbers <laughs> recently, and so it doesn't necessarily help. So if that doesn't help, um, you know, there is no way to avoid how uh, doing the fraction math here. Uh, it's it's got to be done, so you're just going to have to practice it and um, and, and, and get better at it um, and, and figure it out just with the trig part. And that, that's fine if you do that. Okay, so now we're going to go back and, and do it with this. So I know, and here's the thing. When I see that my common denominator is sine squared theta times cos squared theta, well, that's the right side. So that makes a lot of sense that that's what we want to do. So I'm going to multiply this first one by cos squared theta over cos squared theta. That's going to give me a cos squared theta on the bottom that I want. And um, it's going to give me a cos squared theta on top as well. But I'm multiplying by 1. That's why you have to multiply by cos squared theta over cos squared theta. So you multiply by 1 and you're not changing anything. And that's going to give me cos squared theta over sine squared theta cos squared theta. And then the other one I'm going to multiply by sine squared theta over th sine squared theta. So I get a sine squared theta on top and a sine squared theta cos squared theta on bottom, so now I've got common denominator, and I can do cos squared theta plus sine squared theta over sine squared theta cos squared theta. 
And again, I've got the Pythagorean identity on top, so that's 1 over sine squared theta cos squared theta, which is the right side. So we're done. Okay, next one. Again, try it yourself first. Now careful, it does happen once in a while when you are copying these down. Even just, uh, you know, you're not, when you're doing a test, you're not copying questions. So sure, copying into your notes from a worksheet. But more importantly, um, when I write it out as left side and right side, if I copy that down wrong, then nothing I do is probably going to work because now I'm not looking at an identity. Uh, so I got to make sure that I copy it down wrong and I see that there's a squared on top, but there's no squared on the bottom, okay? So watch for that. Now this is a tricky one. I have, but there's a few things. This is a good one for making some observations because I see a couple things. When I'm comparing the left side to the right side, First of all, the bottom of the right of the left looks a bit like the right, so that's something. Um, but the right has just a cosine in it, whereas the left has sine. And the left has a sine squared, and the right doesn't have any squareds. So all those things have to be resolved at some point. But the first thing, because I don't see much else to do, I've got a fraction here, but I don't have any fractions in fractions, and I'm not adding any fractions. So there's nothing I can do there. But what I could do, I suppose, is swap the sine squared out for 1 minus cos squared. And why would I do that? Well, I would do that because uh, now I just have coses. And that's what I have on the right side. And so, you know, that's probably better than being stuck with the sine squared. Now, this is a tricky one. This is a bit different from the other ones we've seen. And um, if you see it yourself, that's fantastic. If you don't, that's fine. I, I don't blame you. Uh, but with practice, eventually, you know, if it's in a question on a test, you'd have to. But once you've seen it a few times, then the idea is you start to look for it. And uh, it, what happens is somebody points out that that top is actually a difference of squares. One is a perfect square and cos squared is a perfect square. So that's factorable. And I can imagine some students thinking, how would I know First of all, that, it's that it is a difference of squares. Well, again, now I've pointed it out. Uh, and now you realize it's something to look for. And this is one of those cases where you can factor. And maybe that's what you should do. But also, how would, the other question is, how would I know that's the right thing to do? Well, when I factor it, and a difference of squares is usually an easy factor. And when I factor it, what I notice is it's 1 minus cos theta, 1 plus cos theta. So again, if you're not fully following that, let me just do this. a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b, right? So my a and my b are 1 and cos theta. And what I notice is um, one of those brackets is the denominator. And the other bracket is the right side of the equation. So when you ask the question, how would I know to do that? Well, you kind of, you either do it and look at the result and ask yourself if it's right, or, you know, just do it in your head and then think about the result and ask yourself if that makes sense. And absolutely 100% in this case, it does make sense, right? It makes a lot of sense. So, um, so then we can see that this bracket and the bottom will divide out and we're left with 1 plus cos theta, which is the right side, and that's what we were trying to find. All right, we've got a couple more, I think, or maybe just one more. Actually, it looks like just one more. Now, we could do a couple things here. We could examine what we have. I've got two things on the left and one thing on the right. And that's a problem that has to get uh, resolved at some point because um, 
I got to make them equal. Okay, so, and those two things on the left are fractions, and I can add them together and turn them into one thing by getting a common denominator. So there's a good chance that that's going to happen at some point, maybe, maybe right off the bat. The other thing I notice is I have sines on the left side and cosines on the right. So you might choose to swap, and it's cos squared, so I can swap that out to 1 minus sine squared. And um, you can only do that with squares, right? So cos x does not equal 1 minus sine x. That's definitely not true. It only works for squares. Okay, so you might do that or you might not. You might wait till later. It, in this case, it really won't matter and we'll, we'll see that in the end. Uh, but if you notice that and you say, hey, I've got all signs on one side and I can easily change it to all signs on the other side, it might not be a bad idea. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get a common denominator. So as I said, our common denominator will be a product of the two denominators. So I'm going to multiply both of these um, by uh, the denominator of the other one, right? So I'm going to end up with 1 plus sine x. And if this fraction math is too fast for you, then just ask and uh, we'll go over it more slowly. Plus 1 minus sine x over uh, 1 minus sine x. 1 plus sine x. Okay. Now, um, and you can see that's the fraction that I multiplied by for that one, and that's the fraction that I multiplied by for that one. Okay. Now, I have, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, expand the bottom. Let me let me do this in 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 two steps actually. So I'm going to bring it all together. One plus sine x plus one minus sine x. Okay, and over one minus sine x. One plus sine x. Now you might notice, and hopefully you do, because that's going to help. That again, that looks like the result after you expand. Uh, or after you factor a difference of squares. So if I expand this, I'm going to get a difference of squares because I have 1 plus something times 1 minus the same thing. Okay? So when I expand that, I'm going to get uh, basically the denominator on the right side. Okay? And uh, so that's how I would know to do that. Um, so hopefully you, you, you see that and you notice that if you don't, well, you got to do something. So hopefully at some point you would notice that you're going to have to expand it. On top, what I see, if I just collect like terms, I get 1 plus 1, which is 2. And I get sine x minus sine x, which is gone. So I just get 2, which is great because that's a numerator on the other side. And on this side, I get 1 minus sine squared x. And if you didn't notice that that's how that was going to uh, work out, and you, you would just expand it, and you would see that the middle terms would add to 0, and you'd still be left with 1 minus sine squared x. And again, that is the right side. If I hadn't done that step before, then I would, um, I would just do it now, right? I would just, on, one, on the right side or the left side, I would sub in to make them be the same. So in this case, this is equal to the right side, which is what we were setting out to prove. So hopefully you got a chance to see some of the strategies in action there, some of the reasons why you would know the strategy, why you would use the strategies, looking ahead a little bit to see that it's a good idea uh, is a big part of it. And the other thing, all I can say is you got to practice and you got to start having some, you got to have confidence in the strategies and you have to start observing and noticing things and, and saying these things that I'm saying out loud to you, saying them to yourself. What else could I do? I don't know if this is the right thing, but what else could I do? So I'll just do this and we'll see what happens. Or, um, you know, I, this is the only thing I can think of and I might as well just try it. Okay? You don't want to stare at these for too long. You want to take action and get started and get trying things, especially when you're practicing because that's how you'll get used to the kinds of things that work and the kinds of things that don't. So hopefully uh, showing how and why we use some of those strategies will help. And uh, good luck with the practice.